When he finished his run, he stepped out of that slab. He said, okay, you fly boys. I proved the human can take it. Go ahead and try it. So they sent this team out there. Um, starting on the left side, the lieutenant is Swindell. He was the uh, flight engineer on the B-29. Myself, Chuck Yeager. Jackie Ridley on the end was the brains of the outfit. Uh, he had a master's in aeronautical engineering. Behind him, the partly bald guy is Dick Frost. He was a Bell test pilot, also worked on the design of the X-1. He knew the X-1 inside and out. And then there's Bob Hoor. Now, General Boyd, whom we greatly respected, was very careful in picking his crew. I know he, I was the last one he called in. He said, you don't have to worry, Bob. I've already picked the crew. Chuck's to be the first pilot. Anything happens to him, uh, Bob Hoover steps in. And uh, listen to Ridley, because he's the, he's the engineer, and Dick Frost knows everything. I said, no, nah. he said, I picked you to kind of be in charge of the whole thing, because you are in charge of the flight testing going on at Edwards, and this is going to be done out at Edwards. Um, I said, may I ask, sir, why, why didn't you pick uh, Glenn Edwards to fly the X-1? Because Edwards, you're going to have stability problems. And Glenn Edwards uh, helped Dr. Perkins write the book on stability and control. He said, Bob, if we pick Glenn Edwards to be the pilot of the X-1, he will be the pilot and he will be the engineer. And then, God forbid, it should happen, but if we lose it, we lose everything. This way, if we lose Chuck, we still got Jackie Ridley. <laughs> um, okay, I said, but how about Bob Hoover? I think he's a better stick and rudder guy. He said, no, I, I agree that he could probably fly the thing, but he said, this airplane does not have a hydraulic system or pistons. Our electrical system, it operates out of just pure gas pressure, some different uh, mechanical gadgetry in it. And uh, Jaeger, well, before he was a pilot, he was a maintenance man. So his maintenance background is another reason. Well, I couldn't argue with that, so away we went. Um, Boyd gave me a set of instructions <coughs> I had it written down and it was also branded on my rear, said um, the project will be progressive, it will be brief, safety flight is paramount, but it is not to prevent success. Well, that meant do it. Next slide. Back east, NACA was building this huge lift to raise their B-50 they were using. Next slide, please. Back in the desert, to be brief, we dug a hole in the ground and put the X-1 down there, and we towed the B-29, next slide, we towed the B-29 over it, and you, we used the internal bomb hoist. Now the B, and the X-1 fueled, completely fueled, uh, is uh, 12,500. We would tow it up, un unrefueled, un unfueled, and then fuel it later. Uh, the next thing, instead of spending another couple of months figuring out how to fasten the X-1 to the B-29, we used a 2,000 pound bomb shackle. And in order so that it would work, we drilled a hole through the bomb shackle and stuck a pin in there. And so that's how you take off with a pin in the hole of the bomb shackle. Um, Jackie Ridley used to fly a co-pilot for me. One of his last tasks up high, uh, helping Chuck get in the thing, handing the door to him to, so he could lock it. Then before I said drop, he would go back and he'd pull the pin out of the bomb shackle. Then we, uh, Chuck would fly at about initially 0.84 Mach and then do a 3G turn. The 3Gs would put a load on the tail he might get it 0.86. So we went in, in increments. On the eighth flight, 
where he was about 0.94, and he started his turn. It started to tuck on him. He began to lose elevator control. And uh, Dick Frost, when we landed, said, uh, Bob, I think what it is, I think the problem is that when that shock wave hits the hinge line of the elevator, the hinge line, it blocks your elevator. And if you happen to be at that kind of an airspeed and any kind of load, positive or negative G, the ship will destruct. Uh, if you prove it, when we built the airplane, we built it that we could unlock the whole tail and move it up or down three or four degrees and then lock it in place for certain specific tests. If you want to, I can unlock it and we can put a worm gear, a vertical worm gear, with an air motor at the front and an air motor at the back because that's all we had to work with and then give Chuck a toggle switch, which he can fly it with the whole tail, we eliminate the problem of a shock wave hitting the elevator because a shock wave will be up in front. So I said, right, Jackie, you're the engineer. Do you think the whole tail will fly off? He said, I don't know exactly. But um, Chuck flew it with the whole tail, and it worked. That immediately, uh, that's when, uh, it was unknown then, it is now because it leaked, it leaked out. When I heard Chuck complain about his Mach meter stuck at one, that's when I did a victory roll with a B-29. I swore the whole crew to silence, otherwise the boy would have had my rear. But next slide, please. Here it is, uh, ready for takeoff. October 14th, 1947. That white stuff uh, next to the um, uh, bottom of the X1 is not paint. That's frost, because just on the other side of that, in one of those big tanks you saw, is 600 gallons of liquid oxygen. And liquid oxygen and sparks don't mix very well. So my concern, I couldn't lift the nose wheel more than about 10 inches without scraping the X1 and that would have been fatal. But I had a long runway, so it didn't bother me. I used to have a nightmare, though, of what would happen if the day came when I said drop, and it didn't drop, when I had to land back on with that thing hanging there. Um, it happened. <laughs> One day, it didn't drop. Although, Jack pulled a pin, but it had jammed. So uh, I told Chuck, come on up, Chuck. No, he said, it, it might drop off, Bob. I'll stay in it until we get down about 5,000 feet. And um, he, he was able to offload about 300 gallons of liquid oxygen. I, that was probably the best landing I've made in any airplane at any time. I didn't even hear the rubber squeal. Next slide. Right at this point is where he turns on the rockets and uh, starts his climb. Up ahead, about 40 miles up ahead, at 40,000 feet is Bob Hoover in an RF-80, a reconnaissance. He had cameras on that one. And as Chuck went screaming by, he tilted his wing. Next slide. And <coughs> took this picture. Hoover took this with his RF-80. Now, you see the exhaust has uh, pulses. Well, the engine isn't doing that. That is the shock wave is now beyond the tail. He's a, gone through Mach 1. The shock wave is behind him, cutting through because the rocket exhaust is solid, and that shock wave is cutting. This was pictorial proof that he had done it. Uh, this was on the president's desk within about 48 hours. Uh, it was proof, and then they slapped top secret on it. Not so much top secret that we'd done it, but how. 